No, I'm just filming it right here, Robert. I'm filming it right here. Order, order. Before I call the Chancellor of the Exchequer, it may be convenient to write, remind honourable members that copies of the budget resolutions will be available to them in the vote office at the end of the Chancellor's speech. It may be also appropriate to write, remind members that it is not the norm to intervene either on the Chancellor of the Exchequer or the Leader of the Opposition. I now call the Right Honourable George Osborne, Mr Chancellor of the Exchequer. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Last year's emergency budget was about rescuing the nation's finances and paying for the mistakes of the past. Today's budget is about reforming the nation's economy so that we have enduring growth and jobs in the future. And it's about doing what we can to help families with the cost of living and the high price of oil. We understand how difficult it is for so many people across our country right now that we are able now to set off on the route from rescue to reform and from reform to recovery is because of the difficult decisions we've already taken. Those decisions have brought economic stability. And without stability, there can be no sustainable growth and no new jobs. Without stability, governments have to keep coming back to their citizens for more, more taxes and more spending cuts. In Britain, we do not have to do that today. We have inherited a record budget deficit, but we have set out a credible, comprehensive plan to deal with it. We have had to undertake difficult measures But we have already asked the British people for what is needed, and today we do not need to ask for more. So this is not a tax-raising budget, but nor can we afford a giveaway. Taken together, the measures I will announce today are fiscally neutral across the period. This is a budget built on sound money, a budget that encourages enterprise, that supports exports, manufacturing and investment, that is based on robust independent figures, a budget for making things, not for making things up. Britain has a plan and we are sticking to it. In recent months, many other countries have seen their ratings downgraded and their borrowing costs soar. Our country's fiscal plans have been strongly endorsed by the IMF, by the European Commission, by the OECD and by every reputable business body in Britain. And for anyone who questions whether this matters in the real world to real businesses and families, consider this. Market interest rates in Greece are at 12.5%. In Ireland, they are close to 10%. In Portugal and Spain, they are 7% and 5%. Today, our country's market interest rates have fallen to 3.6%. We have a higher deficit than Portugal, Greece and Spain but we have virtually the same interest rates as Germany. This is our powerful monetary stimulus to our recovering economy. Stability, credibility, lower interest rates, that is what we have achieved. But stability, Mr Deputy Speaker, is not enough. So today, in addition to the Red Book, we are publishing the plan for growth. For this budget confronts the hard truth that has been ignored for too long. Britain has lost ground in the world's economy and needs to catch up. In the last decade, other nations have reduced their business tax rates, removed barriers to enterprise, improved education systems, reformed welfare systems and increased exports. Sadly, the reverse has happened in Britain. We gambled on a debt fueled model of growth that failed. With the state now accounting for almost half of all income, we simply cannot afford to go on like this. Britain has to earn its way in the modern world. (laughs) Mr Deputy Speaker, I turn to the forecasts. 
Last November, I told the House that the recovery was going to be more challenging than recoveries from recessions in recent decades. That is inevitable when we've had the sharpest fall in output since the 1930s, the highest budget deficit in our peacetime, and the largest banking crisis in our entire history. But I said that thanks to the course we have set, the independent forecast was for our economy to grow in each of the next five years, for unemployment to peak this year and then fall, and for employment to rise through this Parliament. That remains the case in the independent forecast we publish today. <laughs> Those forecasts have been drawn up by the Office for Budget Responsibility. This important change has transformed the way budgets are put together. So instead of Chancellors fixing the figures to fit the budget, they now have to fix the budget to fit the figures. Yeah. Yesterday, the legislation to put the Office for Budget Responsibility on a permanent, statutory and independent footing received royal assent. And I'm sure the whole House will want to thank Robert Choate, Steve Nicholl, Graham Parker and their whole staff for the very professional job they are doing. Let me start with their growth forecasts. Now, it has been known for chancellors in recent years to rattle these off at such a great speed in the hope that no one will keep up or notice. <laughs> I will not do that. Although average quarterly growth this year is set to be higher than was previously forecast, the annual forecast for 2011 has been revised to 1.7%. <laughs> this, the OBR, attributes specifically to the weaker than expected final quarter of last year, the rise in world commodity prices and the higher than expected inflation in the UK. However, the OBR points out that the effect, in their words, is to create scope for slightly stronger growth in later years than previously forecast. <laughs> so while they expect real GDP growth of 2.5% next year, they forecast it will then rise to 2.9% in 2013, to 2.9% in 2014, followed by 2.8% in 2015. The European Commission has also this month published its growth forecasts. These show that the UK is forecast to grow more strongly in the coming year than Spain, Italy, France, the average for the average for the European Union. All countries have to steer a course between two central risks. The risk of a European sovereign debt crisis on the one hand, and on the other, the risk that comes from rising global commodity prices. Food prices around the world have increased by nearly 50% since the beginning of last year. Oil has risen by 35% in just five months. And that is why the OBR expects inflation to remain between 4 and 5% for most of this year, before dropping to 2.5% next year and then to 2% in two years' time. I have today, Mr Deputy Speaker, written to the Governor of the Bank of England to confirm that the inflation target for the Monetary Policy Committee will remain at 2% as measured by the Consumer Prices Index. I can also confirm that the asset purchase facility set up by my predecessor will remain in place. One cause of current instability is the conflict inside Libya. The whole House will praise the courage and professionalism of our armed forces who are trying to bring that conflict to an end and save lives. And I can confirm that the additional cost of military operations will be met entirely from the Treasury Reserve. The House will also know that last week I authorised for the UK to take part in a coordinated G7 currency intervention in support of the Japanese yen. Our hearts go out to the Japanese people and this is one way in which Britain can help. It is still too early to say what lasting impacts the earthquake and tsunami will have on the world economy. But this is an opportunity for me to report that we had already decided to rebuild the UK's foreign currency reserves, which are at a historically low level. We will purchase a range of high quality assets, though unfortunately with the price of gold now at a record high, we will not be able to replenish the gold reserves sold at a record low. <laughs> Mr. Deputy Speaker, I turn now to the fiscal forecast for our debt and deficit. 
Borrowing to fund the deficit this year is now set to come in below target at £146 billion, then fall to £122 billion next year, then £101 billion the year after, then £70 billion in 2013-14, then £46 billion, and then £29 billion by 2015-16. Inflation has had its impact, but crucially the OBR assessed that next year's structural deficit remains the same as forecast last November. In other words, the size of the task of repairing Britain's finances is unchanged. Our national debt as a share of our national income is forced to be 60% this year before peaking at 71% and then starting to fall, reaching 69% by the end of the period. This leads me to one of the central tasks of the OBR, that of assessing the government's performance against its stated budget goals in an open and independent way so that we avoid repeating the disastrous experience of the so-called golden rule. <laughs> Our fiscal mandate is to achieve a cyclically adjusted current balance by the end of the rolling five-year forecast period, which is currently 2015-16. We have supplemented that with a fixed target for debt so that debt should be falling as a proportion of GDP by the year 2015-16 as well. I can report to the House that the OBR confirm that on their central forecast we will meet both these objectives, a balanced structural current budget and falling national debt by the end of the Parliament. Indeed, the forecast remains that we will meet both these objectives one year earlier. Yeah. But Mr Deputy Speaker, I said at the start that stability and fiscal responsibility were not enough. Our country has to compete if we are going to create jobs and growth. Britain has fallen behind many others in the world in the last decade. We've dropped from 4th to 12th place in the World Global Competitiveness League, and growth in our country has become so unbalanced. Consider this staggering truth. During the boom years before the bust, private sector employment actually fell in a region as important as the West Midlands. So today's budget is an urgent call for action for Britain. Private sector growth must take the place of government deficits. Prosperity must be shared across all parts of the United Kingdom. Yes, we want the City of London to remain the world's leading centre for financial services, but we should resolve that the rest of the country becomes a world leader in advanced manufacturing, life sciences, creative industries, business services, green energy and so much more. This is our vision for growth. Difficult decisions and major reforms are needed to make it happen. But the alternative is to accept Britain's economic decline and a continuing fall in the living standards for our population. And that is not an alternative anyone in this House should be prepared to accept. Yeah. Mr Deputy Speaker, this budget sets for Britain these four economic ambitions. That Britain should have the most competitive tax system in the G20, be the best place in Europe to start, finance and grow a business be a more balanced economy by encouraging exports and investment, and have a more educated workforce that is the most flexible in Europe. Let me set out the measures now that will achieve these ambitions. First, taxation. Here's the truth. Britain used to have the third lowest corporate tax rate in Europe. It now has the sixth highest. At the same time, our tax code has become so complex that it recently overtook India to become the longest in the world. From Adam Smith to Nigel Lawson, people have set out the principles of good taxation. And this government declares these principles again for the modern age. Our taxes should be efficient and support growth. They should be certain and predictable. They should be simple to understand and easy to comply with. And our tax system should be fair, reward work, support aspiration, and ask the most from those who can afford the most. In July last year, we set up the Office of Tax Simplification to provide independent advice on how to reduce the complexity of the existing system. I want to thank Michael Jack and John Whiting for the work they have done. Following their recommendations, I can announce today that this budget abolishes no fewer than 43 complex reliefs. This includes the Millennium Gift Aid system, which we won't need for another 989 years. <laughs> However, I have decided not to follow their advice to abolish the community investment tax relief and instead I encourage people to take it up. But this budget, at a stroke, removes over 100 pages from our tax code and begins the work of simplification. Yeah. 
In the last budget, I announced that from next month, welfare payments and public service pensions would be uprated in line with the Consumer Prices Index. I said at the time we should also consider uprating the tax system in the same way. So from April 2012, the default indexation assumption for direct taxes will move to CPI. There will be protection through this Parliament for those eligible for age-related